save regularly, earn interest, and of course manage your account online. Only one bank does it differently. This bank only invests in things which are good for both people and the planet. Things like renewable energy, organic farming, and ecological development. This bank invests in businesses that want to make a healthy profit and want to make a positive difference to society. This bank finances those businesses only with money from their depositors and investors. So the money those people save is invested back into the society they live in. It's actually very simple. Both savers and investors help to build a better, more sustainable world. That one bank is us. Follow your heart, use your head. Triodos Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, hello, good evening, and welcome. Um, welcome to the fourth Schumacher le lecture of the Big Green Week. Um, as you can see, we've got two of our three speakers. I am assured that Kevin McLeod is somewhere in Bristol rush hour and should be joining us as soon as possible. So, so he will be joining us. Um, but just a little introduction. My name is Juliet Davenport. I'm CEO and founder of a company called Good Energy. Um, the UK's 100% renewable electricity supplier. And I'm really excited about chairing tonight's session because the title, Regeneration for Real, is kind of what we do as a company. Um, it's not just about lectures and speeches and policies. It's actually about what you do on the ground and actually getting your hands dirty and getting involved. Um, Good Energy for the last 10 year, 12 years has been trying to get take practical action in engaging individuals and in generating their own power and buying and selling their own power. And hopefully this will be part of the solution to a moment that we're dealing with in terms of climate change and security of energy. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to present two of our three speakers tonight, Tim Smith and Rob Hopkins, who really get out there and get on with regeneration. Our first speaker tonight is going to be a slight change and will be Rob Hopkins. Um, in a, described recently in a TED lecture as the gentle giant of the green movement, he slightly cringes as I repeat that, is the co-founder of the Transition Network for him in 2006. Um, he was the author of the Transition Handbook for Oil Dependence to Local Resilience and is essentially, for the layman, the brainchild behind Transition Towns. Um, most recently, I came across him at Hay Festival sporting a piece of cake, explaining to everybody how the local economy works with raisins and all. Um, he's going to give us an idea tonight of actually regeneration for real through the Transition Town Network. Thank you, Rob. Good evening, and uh, thank you very much. Well, um, Bristol's my... my Bristol's my hometown, really. I lived here from the age of 13, and uh, when I was growing up here, it's going to make me sound terribly old, I'm not that old, but when I, grew, was, when I was growing up in Bristol, the area around here still looked like this. This picture was taken in the early 70s, but uh, we used to come off, get out of school and go down there and wander around in these fantastic old warehouses and things all falling to bits and take photos and drink cider and get up to no good down there. It was fantastic. And, uh, but what's happened since then, obviously, is there's been a huge amount of regeneration that has gone uh, on in that area. And I suppose what I want to do is to really look at uh, how we might think about regeneration uh, in the times that we're in now. Because uh, although there are some many good things that have come out of the regeneration of, of that part of Bristol over the years, I think we can also look at that form of regeneration as like an extractive industry where, where, where capital has come in from around the world and has largely sort of sucked a lot of the, the benefits that have been generated from that out from, from Bristol. And all the things that it could have made possible uh, have, have largely kind of uh, have, have largely disappeared. And I suppose the question is really, would we do it like that again now? Uh, the, that re regeneration was done at a time when credit was, was, was very much available, when cheap energy was what underpinned how the world uh, worked. 
uh, when we didn't have to worry about climate change. Uh, all those things are very, very different now. We live in a very, very different world. And I think if we were looking now, particularly in terms of what's happening with the, the debt crisis that's just starting to unravel, that kind of, my voice is doing all kinds of strange things. <laughs> I think we just figured out. Is it sounding as strange for you as it is for me up here? I'm sure it'll settle down in a minute. Um, because I think we are reaching the end of the age of growth as we've understood it uh, up until this point. Uh, and so when we think about regeneration from this point moving forward, I think we need to think about it in very different ways. So transition, which I've been involved with for the last five or six years, has really been an approach which is about what it looks like if, as communities, we start to try and take the lead on this. Because ultimately, there is no cavalry coming to the rescue of economies such as Bristol or any of the places that any of you live now. I think we're in entering increasingly uncertain times, increasingly choppy waters, and there are, isn't going to be the sort of great influx of cheap credit and so on that we've had up until now. We are that cavalry for the places that we live. So what does that actually look like uh, on the ground? What does that look like on, on a day-to-day -day basis? So transition has started really as a bottom-up, people-led response which is about resilience. How do we make our communities more resilient? And I just want to show you a very short little clip from a film called In Transition 2.0, which we released recently and just showed this afternoon, which kind of captures uh, how transition approaches the idea of, of local economies. You can think of the economy of the place that you live as being like a big bucket. And into that bucket go pensions, wages, grants, and so on. But at the moment, things like supermarkets, paying our electricity bills, internet shopping, are all drilling holes into that bucket that means that our accumulated wealth and its potential are just draining away. And everywhere that there's a leak in that bucket is a potential local livelihood, potential local business, or training opportunity for, for young people. So things like supporting community energy companies, supporting local food where it's available and boosting that where it isn't and using local currencies are all very skillful ways of plugging the leaks in that bucket. So what I'd like to do is to offer six sort of principles that might underpin how we think about regeneration as we move forward uh, in, t in, in the 21st century. And the first one is resilience. And it's really... A, a, Resilience can be seen as quite a complicated sort of highfalutin idea, but Ian Dowie, who used to be the manager of Crystal Palace, summed up resilience very nicely. He described it as being bounce back ability. And I think that's what we really need in, in, in our economies as they increasingly are buffeted here and there by volatile energy prices and, and, and so on. This photograph is from uh, transition town Tooting in London, who held a huge big street carnival called the Trash Catchers Carnival, which got hundreds and hundreds of people out on the streets. They used a million old plastic bags and crisp packets for all the things. At the end, when they all sat down with, the, with everyone who'd been involved and said, what are your reflections on that? They said, if we can do that, we can do anything. And that's a key part of resilience, I think, having communities who feel that sense of, 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 of possibility. So a few things just to give you a taste of what transition groups are doing around resilience, I think. Because resilience in transition starts from the bottom up. You and I come together in the places that we live. We say, right, what, what are we passionate about? What, where, where do we feel we want to make stuff happen? This is in Bath, transition Bath. Hedgemead Park in Bath, big circular flower bed. Council weren't using it anymore. The transition group came together, taken that over and now call it Vegmead Park and are growing produce right in the middle of the town with, with, with volunteers. In uh, Kilburn, on Kilburn Underground Station, the local transition group there have taken over that part of the Underground Station. They are the first London Underground Station where you can get off and pick some salads and strawberries on your way home. They're the first London Underground Station with apples growing on the platform. And this kind of thing can only really come from the bottom up by people coming together. This can't really be dictated from the top down. This is ordinary people deciding they want to take control. It's what we call engaged optimism. What does it look like when we, when we apply that? Also, when we're thinking about regeneration, I think the whole idea of the whole area of food is really, really central. This is a project, not a transition thing, but this is in Hackney, growing communities. Uh, they supply vegetable boxes to about 3,000 people a week, but they also have set up lots of uh, market gardens growing in and around Hackney. They have what they call patchwork farming, where people grow on small bits of ground all around Hackney. I think when we're looking at regeneration in the urban context, weaving that through uh, what we do is really, really important. And that's not a new idea. This, I love this, is a photograph of the Bristol and District Market Gardeners Association in 1897. 
this was a time when all through Bristol, Bristol was ringed by market gardens who were actually you know, one of the key employers uh, in the city. And a lot of the development was sort of, uh, of, of Bristol was followed by, by the market gardens. And it's, it's something which I think we'll start to increasingly see social enterprises setting up. And I was reading the other day in Scotland now, they're looking at legislation which would make, which where there would be a, a, an assumption in favour of using undeveloped land in cities for growing food. The second one is about low carbon, which I'm sure Kevin will, will talk about more than myself, but uh, obviously any new development, any regeneration has to be underpinned by, by being low carbon. I love this, the, this house and the one next to it are in Ebervale in Wales. And what's really exciting about them is that they're called local passive houses. So they're built using 80%, and one of them using 90% local materials, but they're built to a passive house standard. And I think in the same way when we talk about our leaky bucket, uh, the whole idea of local food, you know, we're quite used to the idea of why we use local food, because it's about supporting local growers and reducing food miles and so on. I think we can apply the same thing to building materials, the whole idea of building miles. That if we can start to build using more local materials, then we start to create a whole uh, number of industries that can, that, 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 that can emerge to support that. And this is one of the things that they're looking at here in Wales. And often there are materials that are actually carbon negative. When we're looking at straw bale, looking at timber, materials that, that lock carbon into buildings, uh, and most of the buildings around here are sort of steel and glass, these kind of materials. Uh, and the potential for, for getting people engaged in and, and producing those is really exciting, I think. When you go to Charing Cross Underground Station, the mural along the side is the old woodcuts showing how Charing Cross was built. Uh, all the different trades that it took uh, to do that, the, 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 the stonemasons and the people making the mortar and so on. And I think when we're looking at regeneration on a kind of an urban scale, we should be looking at having all kinds of apprenticeships and getting people in, learning the different skills. And these kind of more local materials give a lot more scope for that, I think, for, for people to come in relatively unskilled and to pick them up quite quickly. So again, some of the things that, that transition groups are doing from, from the bottom up in terms of uh, reducing carbon and so on. In Belsize in London, Transition Belsize started something called Draft Busters. The idea is that if you've got a house with drafty windows and doors, uh, you have a sort of like a Tupperware party in your house. So you, some people come around and you learn how to draft proof a house by draft proofing that house, and then you get given as a going home present enough stuff to draft proof your own house. Uh, and it's taken off all over the place. And the beauty with something like Transition, which is now happening in thousands of communities uh, around the world, is that when an idea settles in in one place, it spreads very, very quickly. They're like little research and development units. So this is something which is now being done in all over the place through a very, very simple idea, but a very active way of reducing carbon. In Malvern, Transition Malvern, they have these old gas lamps that inspired C.S. Lewis when he wrote the Narnia books. The, the lamp that Lucy sees when she goes into Narnia was inspired by those ones in Malvern. Uh, but they cost a fortune, they're not very efficient. Transition Malvern have made them all over, so they use 84% less gas, and they have this idea that they want to, uh, they're going to set up an anaerobic digestion scheme using local food to power the lamps. Again, this is the kind of thing that people at the grassroots can do by coming together with this idea of engaged optimism. What are they passionate about? So the third one is natural limits. You know, how do we, when we think about regeneration, do it in such a way that it respects the limits, that it's a one planet development? And there's lots of thought gone into what one planet development looks like, which is very exciting. Again, thinking about that, what that might look like uh, from the community scale, one of the things that we've been involved with in transition is this, uh, this thing called trans transition streets. So transition streets is a very simple idea that you get together with your neighbours, the people around you, uh, you go out on the street, you knock on doors, you get a group of people together, you meet seven times, you look at water one week, food another week. But what we found is that actually, uh, uh, in, in, in the place where it was piloted first, that on average people reduce their carbon by about 1.3 tonnes, save themselves about 600 pounds a year. Uh, but when, you, when they talk to each other about it, when, they, when, when you ask them why they do it and what they get out of it, they don't mention climate change, they don't mention oil depletion or economic issues. What they talk about is their neighbours, getting to know their neighbours, new relationships, friends, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and when I meet people, they, they, all they talk about is I now know Dave down the end of the road, Sandra over here, we're doing this together. It's about bringing people together, that, that bringing communities together. All the other stuff is almost kind of incidental, I think. The next one is localization. And I think what we're going to be seeing as we enter the age of increasing energy volatility, we're already seeing it. John Lewis reported last year the takings that they're out of town stores are down by 12%, whereas they were steady uh, in town. As the price of energy starts to increase and the amount you have to pay to do that starts to increase, the economy will start to change. 
in uh, 2008 when oil hit $147 a barrel was the first time it was cheaper for America to produce its own steel than import it from China. And I think what we'll move towards is a far uh, is a near heavy, far light economy where things that are heavy are produced more locally and things that are lighter, like ideas and all that sort of stuff, uh, are transported more uh, over greater distance. So I think it's really, this, the, the idea of localization feels to me like a really big idea of our time and a very practical uh, idea in that sense. And it's really about starting to see community resilience as economic development. Making our communities more resilient could actually be the making of them uh, economically and lead to a, the, 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 the rediscovery of local building materials could really be a sort of um, uh, a, a vernacular building could be the making of us in many ways. I drove past Broadmead today, uh, the new shopping in the middle of Broadmead, looks exactly like the new one that's just opened in Exeter uh, and looks exactly like it does in many other places. We've got this sort of European standard uh, construction in many ways and I think local materials bring us to a, a more vernacular kind of a sense. So this idea about uh, localization, so uh, transition can pick that up. This is in, in Yorkshire, in a place called Slathwaite or Slowit. Uh, their local greengrocer shut down. The local community raised 15,000 pounds to take over the grocers. But it's been more than just a shop. It's been a catalyst for all kinds of stuff around this idea of localization. They found when they were running their own shop, that they needed to, when they were buying garlic wholesale, it was all coming from China. They thought, this is ridiculous. We can grow garlic uh, in Yorkshire. And uh, so they started something called the Slathwaite Garlic Challenge, where anytime you went in the shop to buy anything, they gave you a clove of garlic and said, take it home, grow it, and we'll buy it back off you. If nothing, we'll be self-sufficient in garlic within two years. <laughs> what actually happened was uh, that a cooperative was then set up called Edibles to grow stuff to supply the shop. There's now a wind uh, cooperative set up in the area. And uh, all the local producers in the area recently came together to launch what they called Colnucopia, because it's the Coln Valley. And they issued what they called a Declaration of Independence from the Global Food System, which may be slightly premature, but it's... Uh, <laughs> It shows the scale of ambition, which I rather admire. This is in Topsham, where they've been doing transition for a year. And they said, what is it that brings people together in this town? Is it peak oil? Is it climate change? Might it be beer? It may be beer, actually. So they launched a brewery. They raised £40,000 from local people as a, as a community-run business. This kind of relocalization of the economy can actually do so much in terms of bringing people together and strengthening that economy. And the same in Norwich, out of transition Norwich, Emerge Farm Share is a community supported agriculture scheme uh, with about 80, 90 members now aiming for 200, growing food in, in a way that, that, that people are involved in. But that didn't just emerge out of nowhere. They did a study called Can Norwich Feed Itself and looked at the town in the context of what happens around it uh, and then saw that as being one of the key pieces of, of, of the puzzle they needed to put into place. Community assets, I think, should also be another part of how we think about regeneration. <coughs> because actually, uh, this is Coin Street in London, which is a fantastic example of development which is done by the community itself. All too often, community is done by developers who come in, acquire the site, develop it, uh, extract the profit, leave the, the, the people there with, with the development, and that's the end of the story. At Coin Street, the community owns the site and the development. Every stage of the development benefits the people who live there. The money that it generates is fed back into the development. And I think as we enter a time when there's going to be much less money around, uh, we're going to be needing to start to think like that. This is in Lewis, where they decided they wanted to put re uh, renewable energy in place. Community solar power station raised £350,000 from local people to put that in place in a way that re the energy inf infrastructure is owned by local people. Bath, Bath and West Community Energy, which emerged from Transition Bath, recently raised over £700,000 in shares and have set up in such a way that people can shift their pensions into a local community-run energy company, which is a really, really exciting development. Social enterprise, that this thing should be not just for personal profit, that, that we should be looking at regeneration in such a way that it triggers a whole new uh, economy for the places that we live. The handmade bakery, again, up in Slough, a way of where local people can, can, can invest in. They needed to raise money to, uh, to expand the business. They issued a bread bond. They said, we'll give you 6% interest on your loan to us, thank you very much, but we'll pay you it in bread, which costs them 2%. Fantastic. This is the, the Dunbar Community Bakery, similar model. Absolutely dreadful pun on their poster. Your bakery needs you, I do apologize. The Bristol Pound, which is about to launch uh, as, a, as a currency, complementary currency scheme for this city, is again a really exciting tool for starting to block uh, the leaks in the, in the leaky bucket and start to really look at how you make uh, money support the resilience uh, of the city of Bristol. 
So I just want to, as, as a closing thing, really talk about a project that, that I'm involved with where we're trying to do this, really. Uh, I'm based down in Totnes, and uh, all too often we hear projects about communities trying to acquire and develop sites and it just taking forever. And we've been involved for about four, four years. This is the old milk processing plant in the 1930s next to the railway station in the town. In the 1960s it was producing a tonne of clotted cream a day, milk from 1,300 farms. Uh, and then in 2007 it closed, 160 jobs were lost and the community came together to say we want to bring this site into community ownership to develop it in the way that I've been talking about. Uh, and the, the site's owners have largely sort of dismissed it for, for during that period of time. We did designs, we did all kinds of stuff for, that, for, for the proposal in order to move it forward, weren't getting anywhere with the owners at all. Three months ago, we started a campaign to try and pressure them into, uh, in, 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 into taking us seriously and engaging with us. Uh, we met with Jonathan Dimbleby, who's one of the patrons, 350 people down there one morning for a big photograph, big public events. We ran a campaign which included interviewing loads and loads of people in the town, asking them what, what, what they would like to see happen on the site. And, and what's happened is uh, that about three weeks ago we met with the owners uh, and it seems to be all of a sudden everything has shifted. They said, well, we are committed to working with you partly because we have no choice. <laughs> And I think when you can generate that sort of community momentum around, based around this idea, all sorts of things are possible. So to pull it together, really, I would just like to say, I think that when we look at regeneration, we should be looking at it, uh, well, it's all to, I'll start that again. I think when we think about regeneration, uh, it's accepted now that we would do an environmental impact assessment. How is this regeneration going to impact the, the local environment? I think we also need to be looking at doing a resilience impact assessment. How is this regeneration going to help this community? How is it going to create as many jobs and training opportunities for our young people? How is it going to create as many opportunities for people to invest inward in, into this place as we can? How can we start to plug as many of the leaks as possible by doing what we're doing here? What kind of a legacy is it going to, to to leave. There's all kinds of tools available now through the localism stuff, but at the same time we have this push for growth which is largely at the expense of communities rather than seeing communities as what can deliver this. And I think there's a, there's a huge missed opportunity here. So, um, uh, yes, and so there's, I, for me it's really about how we put resilience central, how we put communities central, and then we can really create something which is going to uh, be a fitting form of development for the next 20, 30 years, because the next 20, 30 years are going to be very, very different from the 20, 30 years that we've just had. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to introduce Tim Smith, <laughs> <laughs> strangely enough, who again needs little introduction. Um, as reputation as inspiration and maverick, um, I would say, behind the highly successful Eden Project. Um, I, was, I must admit, Tim, when I first met you, I, I did think of a 17th century explorer on your way to Australia, but instead of the world of Australia, kind of the world of sustainability. And that, that's, how, that's how I sum you up. Um, and, and also, despite saying Britain is crap um, at entrepreneurialism, um, they, still, <laughs> they, still, they still managed to appoint you an honorary Knight of Commander of the Order of the British Empire, is that correct? <laughs> anyway, Tim, I'd love to, please, please welcome Tim Smith to the stage. Well, hello everybody. Um, I never quite know what I'm going to say when I get up, so I'll just have a bus. I'm going to run at this really fast, I'm going to talk really, really fast, okay? That's the only way I can do this. Um, we're going to talk about regeneration, I think. I want to tell you about the worst speech I've ever made. The worst speech I've ever made in my life was when I was invited by the Historic Houses Association, don't you know, to go and speak to them. After I'd restored the Lost Gardens of Heligan, it had won all sorts of awards for this TV documentary and blah, blah, blah. So they thought, because my degree was in archaeology, and I'd just done a restored garden, that I was just like them. And I got there, and you've got to imagine the scene. All corduroy trousers and tweed jackets with a leather patch, and they were called Nigel. And they, they, all, they all wanted hints as to how to market their stately homes and gardens. And I, I alienated the entire audience in the first sentence because I said, if you can't get drunk in it, you don't feel like dreaming in it, and you're not inspired to make love in it, for fuck's sake, tarmac it. <laughs> this, went, this went down really badly. Um, the point I was trying to make was, in, in Britain, there's a tendency to want to hold on to the past as if it was a better place. The fact that most of us would have been burnt at the stake, you know, forget that for a moment. And if a 1920s car were to go through that door right now, 
other than the regrettable loss of life over here, all of you lot would say, what a beautiful old car, just because it's old. And of course we know that in the past the air was full of the smell of bread being baked. All cottages were thatched. Let's go visit the dentist, shall we? <laughs> now, I, what I want, what want to talk about, really, I don't know whether you know this, but right now, in the UK, right now, we are living in a renaissance of science, the like of which has never been seen on this planet before. The steps that have been taken by British science, British science, are so major, and yet because our media is arts-led, confusing culture with just the arts, we never get told any of it. So we think we're living in a nation that's going to hell in a handcart, in many ways, and we're not. We're living in a place with some of the smartest people on planet Earth. That are, I, I had the privilege of judging the Carbon Trust Awards last year. I can't tell you how exciting it is to walk in and see these really cool people doing fantastic stuff. So what's the problem? A fact you may not know. City and guilds. You've all heard of city and guilds? Yeah. I wonder how many of you would put your life on betting how many people in this country have a city and guilds qualification? 20.1 million. Yet they have no alumni society. They have no continuous professional development. So one of the problems I came across at the Carbon Trust was all the things I thought should win, my fellow judges said, I can see why he chose that. I can see why he chose that. Brilliant, isn't it? They shouldn't win, though, because we live in a construction industry and a design industry that is so conservative that introducing new stuff, there's a break on it. A replacement for concrete, for example, it's very difficult to get big contracts for it. And yet, we live in a digital age. We live in a digital age. The project we're working on at Eden at the moment is a project called How To. We want to create the world's first digital technical college coming out of what Eden is about. It began with an idea. A friend of mine was in India looking at carvings on temples, and he was told that there were only four people left in the whole of India that could actually carve to the certain standard required for the restoration of Jain temples. These skills are going. <laughs> that felt very strange. <laughs> um, so, you got ghost problems. Yeah. I've actually had ghost problems, you know. We had to have exorcisms at Heligan, but that's another story. Um, so anyway, the idea was to try and capture these skills and film them, and we were going to work with, with the guys who make Wee Man, so that you could actually create computer models of actually hand movements and everything else and make them available as, a, a, as an international database working with UNESCO. But then, far from this highfalutin idea, it suddenly dawned on us the tremendous dearth in upgrading skills in this country. And there's a real block. And I'm now going to alienate probably the rest of the audience with this. The universities in this country have done us so much damage. You have no idea how much damage has been created by the great engineers of the past, their work has been stolen by the, engineer, by the universities of today to claim that they built the great country we live in. And when you see the funding that goes to the universities, and you see the funding that goes to further education colleges, and the fact that then those who run further education colleges think their job is to teach people of a blue-collar persuasion that their job and their future is about installation, you can see the rot setting in, can't you? Because we are not a nation of installers. We should not see ourselves as a nation of installers. If you are only an installer, you cannot design a new future. You need to understand the foundation learning that goes into being able to design new things. So what How To is about is about and we're not going to own it. We, just, we want to do it at Eden and get all sorts of people involved in it. Funny enough, we're, we're, we're hoping that, that two of our partners are actually quite traditional, the BBC and the Open University. The Open University wants to come out and actually embrace further education. So we're going to have a meeting between white collar and blue collar, which will be quite interesting. But I'm hoping it will need some hybrid vigour. <laughs> so the other thing is, um, I wasn't sure where to take this talk. 
is about negative people. One of the staff rules at Eden is, I kill negative people. <laughs> I cannot tell you how much I loathe negative people. Do you want to know how much I, I, I loathe them? That psychologically, when I make, say that, I very rarely smile. And I imagine, as I say it, disemboweling them very painfully, and then, if they're still alive, scrubbing them out with my heel, because they are alien spawn. <laughs> oh, they are. Those negative people are alien spawn. Don't make the mistake. And I'm not joking. Do you see me smile? Mm, no, I don't. They hate us. And you know why they hate us? Because we have dreams. We believe things are possible. We believe you can actually change the world. You can actually get people to work and do amazing things. They don't want that. <laughs> amazing things is a slight to them. So if they've got dreams, I'll kill them first. I've seen whole organizations brought to their knees by negative people. I have. And then the, the guys who finish it off completely are the accountants. After that, <laughs> they come in and, and they are actually often quite positive. My partner is an accountant, so I say that as he's about. But the problem with accountants is that they know the cost of everything and they think that that is the same thing as business. Knowing the cost of things is really different to knowing the cost of not doing things. You see, one of the things I love about what Rob does with Transition Towns is he actually shows that things can be done. Yeah, yeah, you guys can talk over there, let's do it. Let's get dirt under our fingernails. But we have, in our government, we have politicians, we have business advisors who think that money is all about cost. I'll give you an example. The Eden Project cost 144 million pounds. We have created wealth in Cornwall, independently, people have <coughs> uh, 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 added it up, of 1.2 billion pounds. Yet you could never have borrowed 144 million. We needed state assistance to start with. We pay our own way now. The thing is, no one ever estimates where you are saving money. The great study that was done in Chicago, which I'm sure you're around, the, the restoration of the park in Chicago, they worked out that all the streets that fed into that park the suicide rate went down, the violence went down, the depression went down, and you added up the cost to the medical system of Chicago of that park being crap, and then you saw the costs not taken on board through restoring the park, it was chicken shit money. The investment was tiny for the outcome. So we need new economic systems, but they don't need to be hippie shit. They just need to actually be proper. I mean, isn't it amazing that, that, that you go to America, you go to fast food joints around here, right? We buy food, cheap food. The reason it's cheap, the reason most of the cheap food, this, this stuff is cheap, is because we pay the bills later on. For all the guys who die of heart disease or whatever, we pay that bill, just like we have to get rid of their trash. We do not cost in the proper cost of natural services. The Eden Project is gonna radically change over the next two years. I'm bored with plants. Oh. I mean, let's be honest, guys. Once you've seen one, you've seen them all, haven't you? I mean, all you really need to know is green side up. And, and, and the other thing is... You heard it here first, OK? The truth, the truth is that plants don't sing and dance. I've recently discovered that, which makes it... Which make, it's taken a long time, I know, but... But it, the, the problem is to get people excited about plants is really tricky because there's a group of people who are excited about plants and then it seems to stop. But actually what we're about, and what we all ought to be interested in, is the dermatology of the world, the skin of the world. Do you know how interesting microbes and bacteria are? And fungi, ooh, fungi. Let me tell you something that no one in this room knows. I've written a preface to a book about fungi, and I know nothing about fungi, and they say, that's terrific, maybe it'll be interesting. The first chapter, I felt I ought to read it because it's a bit rude to write a preface to a book you haven't even read a word of. And I read it and my hair stood up on end. Do you know there are fields in Dorking that have never been farmed? There's been no pesticides, no fertilizers, no tractors ever been on it. And they did an experiment which should have been on the front page of every damned newspaper in the world. Do you know what they did? They piled up a huge pile of horse manure in the corner of a field. And then they did a test across this field. And they discovered that in 48 hours, the nutrient from that manure had been equally distributed across the entire thousand acres. <coughs> Think about that. 
just imagine that Jim Lovelock is actually right. That as opposed to Gaia, the world is a breathing planet, it's all connected, yadi da 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 let's weave some more muesli. <laughs> he's right. Just imagine he's right, and we've got a planet that is interconnected in a, a literal way rather than a philosophical way. What this got to do with regeneration is about linking things together. People don't link things together. So, for example, we are starting a, 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 an energy buying cooperative with Cornwall Council, the Healthcare Trust, the Emergency Services, and the 30 leading companies in Cornwall. Loads of people have done that, haven't they? It's a nice thing to do, but we're going to use our buying power to create a membership organisation to which other people can buy in. But it's pretty simple. The interesting thing, though, is that when you start looking at fuel poverty, and you then get people to become members who are in fuel poverty, defined in certain ways, you can then link them in to retrofit schemes and link them into training through the Green Deal. And no one does that. No one actually does, you can do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. And I'm really going to hear, hear what Kevin's going to talk about in a minute. But one of the things, we're, we're, we're talking to an Egyptian guy who came up with this great concept, um, which is also to do with linking things up. In this country, we have things called affordable housing. Don't we? We talk about affordable housing. In Cornwall alone, for our district councils before they became unitary authority, there were six different definitions of affordable housing. All the councillors love affordable housing until someone puts in a planning consent for affordable housing because what they mean by affordable housing is that their children can buy a house. What other people think is affordable housing is a guy on a dog on a string. And the hypocrisy about affordable housing is amazing. I used to live in a place called Foy, jolly smart in Cornwall. If you wanted to buy, build affordable housing down there, you'd have everybody up in arms. Really. Anyway, this guy, Samuel Saruris, has built a city of 200,000 houses. His phrase, aspirational housing. Now that feels a bit cooler, doesn't it? And the idea that's absolutely terrific about aspirational housing is, how's about you build houses with one bedroom, a bathroom, and a living room with a cooker in it, but planning consent for four bedrooms and a granny flat? Then you work with further education colleges and you say, if you want to buy this place, you don't have to put any money down for a moment, but what you've got to do is you've got to learn how to build the rest of this house. Pretty cool, isn't it? And then you look at the Grameen Bank and the way that they understood. I mean, Mohammed Yunus was brilliant with the Grameen Bank because he understood that when people said poor people don't pay money back, he then didn't do the logical thing of saying, oh, I won't lend money to poor people. He said, well, what could we do that would make poor, pay, but poor people pay money back? He said, you organize them into gangs of eight borrowers. And you only lend money to the second two after the first two have paid their first installment back. So you create a group, a community group, community responsibility. The payback rates for the poor people through the Grameen Bank are greater than for the middle class of Totnes, I'm quite sure. I've heard things about the middle class of Totnes. <laughs> so, OK, stay with me for a moment. Affordable housing, which we've now called aspirational housing. We've linked it to education and training to build the rest of your house, which will also give you added value, right? But what you do is you move further education to where you're going to build the houses. You build a big warehouse inside which people teach people how to do this stuff. And you give the money for eight houses, eight family groups, and no one can live in them until all eight are finished. It's bloody simple, actually, a lot of this stuff. But you need to have a movement. And I'm really hoping that Kevin can shine a light on this because I actually think you could have a revolution in house building in this country if you set it up like that. Reward, carrot, stick, carrot, stick. You learn something. You create a genius. He's telling me there's five minutes left. The last thing I want to talk about because you will notice I haven't really talked about regeneration, is language. <laughs> I adore words. Have you ever spent a long time with environmentalists? Have you? <laughs> Hands up, anybody who spent a long time with an environmentalist? Yeah, it looks like it. Ooh, jeez. I'll tell you what, they're really boring. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll tell you what, most have got dandruff, and almost all of them, if they've got hair, and almost all of them have got bad breath. And they talk about centers of excellence, out-of-the-box thinking, joined-up thinking, leading edge, cutting edge, bleeding edge. Let's think the unthinkable. You see it all over the country. 
the language of the environment movement is so bad. Sustainability. My God. Come on. It is dull, isn't it? No one really knows what it means. It sort of kind of sounds science-y, doesn't it? You know the Natural History Museum? They did a survey of biodiversity. 80% of the people who went to the Natural History Museum had no idea what biodiversity was. That's a success, isn't it? <laughs> and it's terrific. Four million people a year go to the Natural History Museum. And if you were successful, I'm sorry, I could say for Eden, this isn't a criticism of the Natural History Museum, right? If we knew what we were doing, surely our culture would have changed. I'd be really cruel. The same for Eden, yeah? If our language was good and we were creating a culture of change, genuinely, as opposed to preaching to each other and having nice little huddles, shouldn't the fact that four and a half million people a year go to the Natural History Museum be changing people's opinions of the fact that we are part of nature, not apart from it? That maybe it is worth nurturing our planet, that the laws of nature apply as much to us as anything else, and we should stop thinking about conquering nature, but being part of that nature. Isn't that telling you something about us? That the language we use must be rubbish. Mustn't it? Because we're not making the changes that we would like to see. We howl and whistle to stop the crocodile from biting our toes under the bed. But the truth is, climate change almost killed us. I mean, forget about climate change actually happening. If you talk about climate change, it's almost like asking people for money now. We've managed to bore ourselves so much with a language that is not about the poetry of being alive at a fabulous place at a fabulous time. I make a plea to all of us to remember poetry. I've changed radically myself doing Eden. I realized something fantastic when I got letters, not just one or two, but hundreds of letters about things at Eden. And I was expecting letters about the biomes, the fantastic biomes, the incredible visionary project we built. You know what I've got the most letters about? The quality of the binding on the bamboo handrails and the fact that someone had bothered to carve beautiful butterflies inside those bamboos where you could only see if you not look down. And when I started getting all these letters, I realized something really profound, which is that all of us actually love beauty. Beauty is such an important word and we've been embarrassed about beauty. But what's great about beauty is when you see beauty and you see the effort that people have put into doing things, it is life-affirming. It is totally life-affirming. So we need to use beautiful words and not be ashamed of beautiful words about what it is for us to be creaturely. Regeneration comes in many, many different forms. But actually, the key thing we all want to regenerate is a sense of belonging. C.S. Lewis, talking about him earlier, made the bestest quote ever, which is, while science can lead you to truth, only the imagination can lead you to meaning. And that is what we need. We need imagination, we need great storytelling, and we need a sense of meaning. And what that means is we need people like our friends over here to tell stories not about nuts and bolts, about the aspirational nature of what it is to be creatures living at this time that make us special. Why should it not be us that is creating a new renaissance? Have we got it? Or are we just simply pigs at a trough? If we are, we'll be found wanting for being homo sapiens. It will be a feat of wonderful hubris. But what an exciting thought that we might be living at a time when the challenges are worthy of getting out of bed with a number of people smart enough to actually grab the future with both hands and a pirate grin. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, hello. Uh, it's very hard going third because all the best bits have already been said. Um, but thank you. Thank you both, Rob and Tim. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 look, regeneration. I mean, a little, it's one of those words a bit like sustainability. I had to make a series about regeneration in Yorkshire, uh, which took six years to make, and we put it on Channel 4 about three years, four years ago. It was, called, it was about a town called Castleford which is near Normanton, which uh, is now famous for growing rhubarb, but actually in the 80s was very famous for those fantastically uh, totemic scenes of, of, 
of lamp posts being felled by miners as police charge the miners in their blanked out uniforms on horses with batons. Um, so Castleford was at the very centre, the epicentre of the miners' strike. And, um, and this is the new bridge across Castleford, and you couldn't hope for a finer symbol of urban regeneration than a bright new shiny piece of architecture, like a bridge or a new library or a brand new pet care centre or a giant out-of-town bowling centre with giant four multiplex cinema attached. Whatever it is. Uh, regeneration. Regeneration is one of those words that gets local authorities really excited, gets councillors and governments really excited because they think it means new and shiny. And we, all of us, are enormously suspect as a species. We're enormously seduced by the idea of the new and the shiny. That's why car manufacturers keep changing the bits of plastic they stick on their Audis every three or four years, just to make them look a little bit newer. And um, it's, why we, it's why we enjoy buying Quality Street, and why so many, actually why so many new statement pieces of architecture in this country look like giant sweet wrappers, you know, from the Gherkin, which is a bit of a sort of Fabergé egg, to the uh, Scottish Parliament, which is just a tent of Quality Street scattered across the streets of, of Scotland. The, 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 the point about the new and the shiny is that it's immensely appealing. It's much more exciting than having to deal with the old and the tired. I speak as one who is old and tired. <laughs> and, and the idea of regeneration, of remaking, of kind of polishing up and having this kind of new, sexy, glistening, kind of rather glamorous, bling future is all very well. But of course, the moment we make anything on this planet, the moment anything new and bling and shiny comes along, it immediately starts to get old. It immediately starts to tarnish. It immediately, the next day, is already history. And in fact, well, what I want to talk about today is actually not the new, not all this stuff, because this is all a bit of a kind of a distraction, I think, from what <coughs> regeneration or remaking our lives is. Um, I'm going to talk, of course, about my business, because we're hoping to come to Bristol and do some work here, and, uh, and we'd like to be amongst friends. But um, I, I also want to talk uh, um, about a little bit more about Castleford. This is the beautiful, bling, shiny new town centre before it was regenerated. No, sorry, I'm so sorry. This was after it had been regenerated. Um, it had two, two million pounds spent on it, moving a market. I think the, three, the fountain was designed. It then didn't happen. The council decided not to put in the open air cinema. The cafes never arrived. And um, instead, instead, this, this pavement, which was designed by what, an international practice of architects who had been invited to take part in the scheme, together with 15 or 20 other international practices, they saw their work slowly degraded, slowly eroded through the process of installation. This paving uh, actually, actually was chosen by the wife of the chief executive of the local council. <laughs> Amazingly enough, I mean, she's not an architect, uh, nor is she even an elected member, nor is even her husband an elected member. Uh, it goes to show just where the real power decision-making lies in local authorities. Um, now, HAP, this is my business, it stands for happiness, a word that I like and make no apology of pursuing, architecture, which I absolutely believe in, and beauty, a word that Tim used, that we don't use enough by, by, by all means. It, we, we did consider it calling it sustainability, happiness, architecture, beauty. That would involve using the S word, <laughs> and it would also spell shab, and we build houses, not, 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 not horrible places. So we decided not to use that word. And um, this is what we kind of stand for. Oh, uh, ecological, sustainable, great word, beautiful, <laughs> delightful, distinctive, social, yeah? All, kind of, all, the, all the kind of things we in, in seek, really, where we live and, and, and how we operate. And um, this is not one of our schemes, by the way. <laughs> this is not what, this is a, a housing estate in uh, Salford. Sorry, no, I beg your pardon, it's in, it's in Edinburgh. No, sorry, it's in, um, <laughs> no, it's everywhere, isn't it? That's the trouble. It's absolutely everywhere. And when I set up our business, I wanted to try and I wanted to try and do the whole yeah low carbon, low energy, low resource thing uh, with housing. But actually, you know what? You can buy a government manual that tells you how to do that. You can build eco homes. You know, I mean, there are there's a whole sections of libraries now about how you can build yourself an eco house, and and there are plenty of people who've done it. And of course, the great thing is that having built an eco house. Uh, if you're a developer, you, you, you put all this fantastic technology in, you know, 
air source heat pumps and mechanical ventilation make it airtight and you, you make it out of hemp and straw and you, 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 you create this kind of low carbon dwelling and it's great and it's exciting and it's the future and then people move in and they open the windows and turn the heating on. <laughs> and and, and that, that's the problem. You know, when I give talks about, about what is an eco house, I start off showing a whole series of slides about what is an eco car and I show a picture of a Prius and a Ferrari and an Aston Martin, and I go through this, and I ask the audience, what is the eco car? And of course, the answer is, none of them are eco cars. You can drive a Prius 80 miles a day to and from work, you can drive to Swindon and back, or you can have an Aston Martin at home, parked up in your garage, you can drive it at weekends and work from home. And who is there? Which is the more ecological car? Is it the Prius, which is there, recycled after six years and there's a problem recycling the batteries, or is it the Aston Martin? 96, I'm not, I don't have an Aston Martin, by the way. Um, <laughs> and nor do I want one. But the point is that 96% of them ever made are still on the road. They're wonderful pieces of craftsmanship. So what, the, the, the same applies to houses. The, the, point, the point is we know we demonize and we sanctify objects, and yet at the same time, the made world is the made world. It's how we use it. It's how we operate within it. It's our behavior which really matters. That's what determines whether we go to war with each other, whether we love each other, whether we live a low-carbon lifestyle, whether we're happy or whether we're furiously mad with each other. But one thing for sure is, I, 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 when I set the business up, I was pretty convinced we wanted less monotony in our world and a bit more diversity and a bit more fun and a bit more joy. I know I'm sounding a bit angry about it, but I... I Joy is a very important thing. Uh, those of you who don't know this, uh, Tim and I are both vicariously involved in, in the uh, Olympics um, in, on its S side. It, we're sustainability ambassadors. I'm not wearing my badge tonight. Um, one of the things, I think one of the few things we've done is, is set up a badge scheme. <laughs> and the first thing we did was to award the badges to ourselves, of course. Um, and I'm still waiting for the job description to come through, Tim. Have you had yours? Have you had any free tickets yet? No. No, neither have I. But the, 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 what really interests me about the Olympics, to be frank, is not the two-week party. It's not the Paralympics afterwards. It's the hangover. It's what's going to happen at the Olympic site for the next five years. And actually, the most interesting time, I think, to visit this place. If you haven't got tickets, don't worry, because you need to go in about 2016 or 2018. Because that's when the local authorities around here, Newham, Greenwich, Tower Hamlets, are going to be taking ownership of what is going to be the largest single open space park program since Hyde Park in London. And some of these buildings are going, and when they go, there'll be self-build opportunities, if I had my way, and there will be community self-build opportunity, and there will be a fantastic opportunity for individuals and communities and, and residents to, to regenerate this area. And already there are tens of thousands of dwellings on the site already which are going to be converted into, into luxury eco-apartments. So this is, a, this is a project on an enormous scale and it's, it's been planned. It's been planned actually, not, not at all as an Olympic event in any way, as I think yesterday's uh, revelations about the contents of the arena at the opening uh, suggest. It's going to be a giant farm which is going to be opened in the arena and then it's going to be brought back afterwards and the arena's going to be turned into a farm in perpetuity. So the, 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 the point is, is, that, is that, that that project, which is going to endure now for something like 100 to 200 years, is designed as an extraordinary legacy development, an extraordinary community uh, project, which is on a scale unlike anything else happening in Britain. And I think if we, if we need to look at that, we need to look, at, look, look to, to East London, we need to look at it, as I say, in five, ten years' time, not now. So, um, so one of the unfortunate problems about regenerating anywhere involving human beings in Britain is the uh, problem, not of NIMBYs, uh, not of red tape and government legislation or the planning process. It's the problem of the car. We have created a society... I, the reason I was late is because I chose... To, to come in my car, I was in Stroud today, and I chose to drive here, and I'd forgotten that there was a rush hour in Bristol. And it's, it sort of, the whole thing grinds to a, an extraordinary halt. And I, I felt deeply humbled by the fact that 299 people had bothered to turn up here on time, and one, me, failed. Um, it, 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 the car is an extraordinary divisive thing because what it does, it creates divisive areas, and it, it's, it, it's very greedy. The car demands a lot of space to park, 
uh, to travel on. It demands a lot of money uh, and a huge amount of resources and a huge amount of intellectual capacity is applied to how to deal with cars in towns and cities and communities and villages. And, um, and as, a, well, as a developer, we try, we try and minimise car use by being quite fascist about things and saying, you can only have 1.5 cars per household. So, OK, you and you are going to have to chop your cars in half because you can only have, you, know, you share that half with them over there. And, um, but that way, by, by, if, if, if you like, when we build houses for people, by exercising a deg degree of probation, what we're trying to do at the same time is to, as well as saying to people, look, please try and use the car less. Please try and minimise use. We as developers have to offer all kinds of alternatives. So we put in bicycle share schemes and we put in monitors into people's houses to tell them when the bus is coming and we, we give them a car club. So we give car share spaces and we try and negotiate with the local authorities so that uh, the people in the car club can get preferential parking in town when they drive in. So there's lots of fun ways of, of doing that. Um, and um, another f absolutely fundamental uh, thing that we, we try and address, and it, it comes back to that, that problem of how everywhere looks the same in Britain now, is we, we try and follow some principles set up by the charity Common Ground, which is about trying to understand local distinctiveness, you know? Now, at Stroud, where I was today, we've opened some allotments on a site where we're developing, and we found some local Gloucestershire apples, which we are taking cuttings of, and those trees we are now growing on to be able to plant out the scheme, so that the scheme will be planted with an apple variety, which is from that place. It's a tiny, tiny thing, but it's about creating local narratives, stories in a place. And this, for example, this is near Swindon, this is, this is culture and history, this is, this is Avebury. It's a massive, wonderful, Neolithic stone circle. This is a 20th century stone circle, <laughs> also in Swindon. It's the magic roundabout. I'll tell you something amazing about the Magic Roundabout. Is there actually, it's, it's five separate roundabouts, right, a big one in the middle. These ones, these ones are conventional roundabouts. You approach them, you drive onto them, unless you're my wife, you drive onto them and you go around them in a clockwise fashion. You get to the middle one, you go around that in an anti-clockwise fashion. And the whole, if you've never driven it before, the whole thing works absolutely intuitively. It's completely brilliant. And there are traffic planners from Tokyo who come to Swindon to look at... I know, I know I'm contradicting myself because I've been slanging off the car, but they, they, Swindon is car city. So they come to, to Swindon. What I'm saying is, is that you know, wherever you are, doesn't matter. My, my parents lived in Milton... I'm just about to talk about Milton Keynes, OK? My parents lived in Milton Keynes. My father moved to Milton Keynes when he retired. He wanted to experience what life was like in a new town. And he, um, and, and, uh, he loved it. My mother hated it. And, and the, the, the day after he died, he said, I'm leaving. But, but he was absolutely enthralled with the idea of the future and how it could be organised and what might happen. And look, Milton Keynes was built on a field. I mean, it had no narrative at all. You go there now and it's still quite hard to find out why it's there and what it's for. But Swindon is not the most glamorous of places and yet it has the most extraordinary collection of historical organisations. The uh, historic monuments records are kept there. The National Trust headquarters are also there. It has a, a World Heritage Site Railway Museum. It, it certainly has an extraordinary history. And, and so, so it is everywhere. And, um, and creating that narrative is really, really important wherever we live. Uh, Isabel Allen, who's our design director in Hab, she says um, she, she's, uh, she's really big on the storytelling of the place. She likes to kind of find out what the local apples are and what the history of the geology of the places and who lived there 5,000 years ago and so on. And to help kind of create a sort of story. And, and, and sometimes it's a bit thin on the ground and, and she said to me recently, of course, the thing is, of course, if there is no narrative in a place, then you just make it up. <laughs> but in a sense, that's what we all do, don't we? Because wherever we live, there is a story of a ghost. Or there is a story of an old man who lives down the lane, you know, who was living there in the 18th century, who had magical powers, who could wash away the sins of the children. And and, and it's very, very important that we not only enshrine that, but we encourage people, uh, when we're, I'm just even we, I mean as developers, we work with, with communities, and, and, we, and we try wherever possible to encourage that process and encourage that, that sense of, of narrative and imagination and storytelling in a place. Because all those big, shiny buildings are lovely, but really, fundamentally, what that happens is is when you bring people together and all they've got is a big shiny building, life isn't really that much improved. 
What, what improves life, of course, is the, is the contact people have with each other. What improves life is, is sociability. What improves life and actually saves the planet is sharing out. Not being selfish, but sharing responsibility, sharing a lift to Marlborough to go shopping. Sharing responsibility, being able to use technology, actually, in your home, like a, a little sort of home computer that's connected to an internet, to be able to say to your neighbours, help, it's 3 a.m., has anybody got any cow pole? My, my kid's screaming, I've got nothing in the house. And for then somebody to come round at 3 o'clock in the morning with some cow pole and say, yes, here we are, borrow this, use this. So this is all the kind of stuff we try and put into our projects. We try and put in the technology. We put in these screens, which I, I'm delighted about because it's the only screen I've ever seen which promotes sociability rather than actually eliminates it from our lives. And we put in shared kitchen gardens and we try and promote uh, fruity streets and edible hedgerows and landscape uh, that is absolutely, um, it's kind of triple, quadruple purpose. So uh, a tree, an, a willow planted into a swale will suck up water and it'll help with the water attenuation and it'll take the, take the pressure off the main system when it floods. It'll provide somewhere for kids to play, it'll provide shelter, it'll provide some microclimate, some cooling, some shading. It also, if you sit under a willow, will remove your headache because it produces salicylic acid which it sort of, it sort of produces as a spray. It's kind of like spray aspirin. Fantastic, fantastic trees. And it does all of these things, and yet a willow costs 60 pence to buy a little willow to put in the ground. If you want a really big willow, oh, how much is that? 15 quid, maybe. 20 quid. I mean, you know, on a scheme, in our gardens, you know, the, the trees represent absolutely the very, very best value. We, actually, to answer that, that question of yours, Tim, you know, how do you kind of value the contribution, the preventive value, uh, of the contribution that, that landscape and, and the environment makes... Uh, what we do in our schemes is we, we, we did one in Swindon where we, we put in some houses and we spent £40,000 on public realm. That's on willows and vegetable gardens and um, trees and grass and wildflowers and herbs and so on. And we put it all in and there were, it was all very, very edible. Instead of, instead of a prickly thorn bush, you put in a, a, a gooseberry. And instead of a, of a decorative shrub, you put in some rhubarb. And... Um, and, and the, 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 the great thing ab about that is that right now there's, a, there's an algorithm being produced by the Horticultural Trades Association together with CAVE, the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, who are sort of sadly no more really, thanks to this government. Anyway, they uh, produced an algorithm which monetizes the health, preventive health, uh, the social benefits and the food benefits of landscape in our built environment. And our £40,000 they valued almost immediately at 500,000 pounds, half a million pounds of benefit to those 42 households from 40,000 pounds of investment. Now, on the one hand, I think, wow, that's amazing because, you know, that really delivers value and we can demonstrate to our banks and our lenders and our partners that doing this stuff and doing big public realm stuff and giving people ownership of their vegetable gardens and shared polytunnels is, is, all, is all very important and, and, and it's worth investing in. On the other hand, a bit of me says, well, how come it's taken us all this time to get to the point where all we have to do is to monetize it into pound notes? Because pound notes is still the only language that any of us still understand, isn't it? That any government that any uh, health uh, department director will ever understand. This is a project in Stroud where I was today where we're doing a similar kind of thing. And uh, where we're building uh, lots of uh, allotments. I've now been told I've got 30 seconds. I've only got another 76 slides. So, this is round two and here. And you can see the depth and the layer, the layering. Here's some swales and willows, and <coughs> where we're trying to do all this kind of stuff. <coughs> and here is a project in Oxford where we're working, trying to um, take the traditional arts and crafts language of Oxford housing and produce um, this is a tiny model of uh, some kind of modern 21st century Oxford typologies. It, everywhere we work, we work with different architects and we try and develop a language of building which belongs to that place. Always, not designing historically, but designing in a language which, which looks as though what we're producing is the, are the, are the grandchildren of the existing houses or the, the, the children of the existing houses, if that makes sense. You know, we're trying to produce the next generation of buildings that look as though they belong really where they are. And we do this with a lot of consultation. And, um, and we believe this, and you can see uh, brilliantly that uh, our, 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 our watchwords here are consultation, empowerment, involvement, 
and trusts and fruity streets. What they, they really say is consultation and working with the community. We also do a lot of design charrettes and, and involve communities in that design process to help us evolve a scheme. Uh, we create community land trusts so that ownership of those schemes can be held in perpetuity thanks to the collaboration of our partners, uh, housing associations, with residents, because that fundamentally, you know, even if you don't own the home in which you live, actually owning your household, owning a title to the public realm around you and to the, to the community uh, around you, the community orchards and the community facilities around you is, is absolutely fundamental. And, fu and as I keep saying, and I, <laughs> fundamentally, uh, well, our big tagline is, uh, is fruity streets. I've been told to stop now. Look. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, thank you. speakers and um, I, I, I think as chairman I get to ask one question but before I ask a question of the speakers I actually want to ask a question of the audience because you know kind of who we are um, but actually we don't know who you are and in a view of community engagement I'd love to know how many people here are practically involved as part of a community either in transition towns or a community that's looking to do sustainable housing or actually get your fingers dirty and bypass the bling. So could we just have a show of hands of how many people feel that they're actually part of this already? So I, I'm, I'm guessing probably 40%, 40-50%. percent So quite a lot of the converted in here. So I guess my question is that we've got, we've got a lot of people who are sort of practically on the ground here. How do we get this out further? How do we get the Daily Mail to be running that these are fantastic projects? And I know you're just proud of me. Four million readers, people who don't tend to get involved in the Green Movement. How do, how do we get this as a wider message going forward um, to all of you? Um, to, well, I think we don't invite columns to the Daily Mail for some stuff. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I mean, I think you pick your battles in life. And, and I've always felt there was no point writing for The Guardian, because you're preaching to the converted. And there's no point writing for The Daily Mail, because they'll never employ you. So, so, so my medium is, is, is telly, and, um, and uh, although it is an enormously conservative medium and very resistant to the idea of promoting anything which might smack of democracy, despite everything that television says, it's an extremely um, atavistic and rather and self-protective medium. Um, but nevertheless, I, I kind of think that you, know, you, 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 you pick your battles and you choose carefully how and where to say things. You know, and I, 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 you know we, we all of us only have so much energy. Yeah. And, um, and, and Tim, uh, and well, you'll know, I mean, how many towns have you got left in you? Tim, how many projects have you got left in you? I mean, we've all, you know, we're all finite in our capacity. And, and, and so it's important to, uh, to kind of spread the word and, 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 and get other people enthused around us. That's absolutely fundamental. But, but um, it's equally important to, to know where to place one's energy. And, and if everybody here who did their hands up went out and converted another person, is that the way that we could not on? I don't know. Well, I think Tim's right when he talks about language, you know, that, that, that actually the, the, the language we use is really, really important. Uh, in terms of taking it wider, I think it's really about just sort of telling the stories about what people are doing. You know, there's, there, there's so many fantastic things going on, and there are mediums for, 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 for telling those stories more widely. If people come to us in Transition Network and say, it's so amazing what Transition Network's doing. There's the Bristol Pound, and there's the this, there's the that, there's all these things going on, but we don't do any of those things. You know, it's very much, we've set it up to be a self-organizing invitation. Anybody who gets involved in doing transition is part of an experiment, is part of shaping what that becomes. You know, we, it's not presented as a model that definitely works, and we don't do it. We, 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 we try and support and encourage and inspire and tell those stories. But I think in, in the long run, where it really starts to, to go much more broadly and much more deeply is when we have, you know, as Tim was saying, in terms of uh, a new industrial re revolution or a whole, when it really starts to gain traction and it's creating training and it's creating work for people, then people don't have to talk about, well, is it because of this, is it because of that? It just becomes like, like a cooperative movement. It started out as a small idea, and after a while it was in creating lots of jobs. And just, just how things are, I think that's where we're going. 
So I, I think you have to look at where we were with ecological green housing <coughs> 10, 12 years ago, where we are now. That, 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 a, that a, 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 um, <coughs> Twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, ecological and microphones don't go together. Yeah, well, what I'm saying is, yeah, yeah. The, the, I, I, I think it's, it's, it, it would be easy to get bogged down and to, to, to become naysayers and, and wring our hands about the lack of progress. But I, I'm an optimist and I, I look at where we are now compared to where we were 10 years ago. We, we have a, 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 a set of building codes now for building our homes, which is extraordinarily stringent, which Gordon Brown introduced. Well, his government introduced, um, which was demanding that all planning permissions by 2016 will be, should be, zero carbon. I mean, that's an extraordinary ambition. And, and it has driven and led to, the, in no small part, in construction, uh, a, 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 a blossoming of technologies <coughs> and of research into building technologies. Because actually, what industry loves more than anything else is, is legislative deadlines. It, it likes to know that by 2020, we've got to be this. By 2050, we've got to be that. And, and then somebody's got something to work to because they know that it's, it's, it's going to be law. They, there's no choice. It's in the market will not be able to offer a choice. Therefore, we have to work towards those deadlines. So right now, for example, the renewable sector is absolute. It's the most fantastic area. As you, you know, Tim, right? it's, it's the most fantastic area of invention and of prototyping and of production. And, and uh, it, it, where we've been since, what, 95, 2000, you know, is I, I think we're leagues ahead of where we thought we would. I agree. Do you want me to terrify you? Um, I, I, we're, we're exploring whether we're going to build an Eden project in China at the moment. And uh, so we've been talking to quite a lot of senior Chinese people. These guys are about to do something astonishing, absolutely astonishing. The next five-year plan, which starts in November, the centerpiece of it is a return to Taoism as a state secular religion. Why? Because Taoism, as you all know, is about living with the grain of nature. Loosely put, it is living with actual. And the Chinese have recognized that they have exploded in terms of wealth creation and whatever it is. When history is told 500 years from now, what's happened in China will be seen as the most astonishing piece of human development ever. It is an extraordinary thing. But they realize that if they go the way that we in the West, in Western Europe and America go, they're doomed. Their water courses are on, on the brink of being totally poisonous. Their air is poisonous. So they are going to use, if you like, secular religion, which will be taught in every school, to transform their nation so that they don't become the pigs at the trough that we've become, and they create virtue out of waste not, want not. And they realize, they, they also want to do it inside five years. And you see, all of us, uh, actually, where the wrong audience says to, an awful lot of people in the West have used China and India, the emerging economy, yeah. as the excuse for us not doing stuff. <coughs> and what's actually going to happen in five years' time, we are going to look really stupid. And part of the problem is we are dying. If you look at Britain, in many ways, we are dying. We have become liberally flabby. We excuse everything. And actually, we need to have the language of a passion of what a sunny upland might look like to us collectively. And there is only one area to go, alone, one, education. It is demonstrably so that if you educate people, you've got to decide what you're going to educate them in, okay? but if you educate people, you can transform lives. So, you know, just as a thought, I think you should charge £5,000 a term to every child in Britain to go to school. And if your child actually turns up to every lesson, you get £5,000 back. But seriously. <laughs> I said that. Well, I'm, you I'm, heard I'm, it first here. No, 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 no. I'm absolutely serious. If you travel around, like you do, like I do, you go to the Czech Republic, you go to Europe. We are just not awake. When you see the speed of development in these countries and the way they're doing leaps of technology, we should be terrified. And yet this was the finest manufacturing nation on earth. In 15 years, our folk memory, going back to what you were saying about, our folk memories will forget that. 
we still have, I think, maybe 10 to 15 years to reinvent ourselves, but based on foundations of who we were, is my view. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to open Old the Testament prophet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to open the um, uh, the floor questions. To the floor. Um, I'm going to try and take. I don't know. Please, could you raise your hands? There is a loud speaker here. Um, we have one question over there by the pillar. Um, I'll come to you. It's a very loud speaker. <laughs> uh, um, from starting, I've made observation Tim Smith made. It says we we come here probably a lot of seem to you for our group hug. So to be with like-minded individuals. And two nights ago, I was speaking to someone at Townsend, and I said, well, there are kind of four different types of people. They're the mainstream, you know, all the people who aren't here, the Daily Mail readers. They're the amphibians, part of the mainstream. They're the hydrophobics, those who really don't want to be in the stream. And there are, there are the, the group that is um, turned, I suppose, what is a stream? And they're probably all in here. Any observations? <laughs> I can take another question, you can think about that. Can we, can we take another question at the back there, please? And, and there's another one somewhere over here. We'll take three questions and then, then give Tim time to come back on that one. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Chris Morton. I run a couple of companies, Organic Power and um, Eco Transit. I was here, I don't know, 1993 about, and Bristol was going to be the, the, the greenest city in Europe. And it was all going to happen, and we had all sorts of plans. I was working with a guy who's um, sorely missed called Richard St. George, who's no longer with us, but we, were, we did an awful lot of work then. And if I think about, I think it was Einstein that said, you can't solve the problems using the same thinking that's got us into the mess in the first place. And it seems to me that that's what we're doing. We need, we need some really different thinking. And we tried different thinking then. We, I've got worldwide patents on uh, processes which let, allow vehicles to run on waste food. The, the waste food or the organic waste from Bristol then was going in two or three trains a week to be landfilled out in, in Buckinghamshire. But we're still not, the, 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 I think the, the air quality in Bristol is probably one of the worst in this country. And why, why, are, we, why are we trying to do the same things with the same people? We need really, really big changes. And I'm asking the three of you, where are these big changes? Where's the big thinking? Well, we're the same people, though. That's the trouble. We are. I mean, we've been doing it for too long, maybe. I don't know. Have, have, have we all been doing it for too long? Have we? I don't know. I mean, I'm just wondering whether or not there's, you know, uh, it's, it's an interesting this thing, this thing about human energy, isn't it? It's a really interesting point, and, and, and what it takes to, 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 to make change happen. And in the end, we can think, and we can think. And I take, I take your point, Tim, about education. But ultimately, uh, what drove me to uh, distraction was the fact that I was making programmes, supposedly educating people. You can't really educate people on television, you can just show and tell. Um, and I was doing a bit of thinking. But in the end, I thought, well, actually, there's nothing like doing. And, you know, in the way, doing is, and the, the, the infection of doing is, I think, a more powerful force. And um, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a room full of like-minded people, but thank God, because then we can all go out, you know, and maybe spread the word a bit and work with friends and neighbours and keep doing it. And it is, you know, ultimately, I, 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 so I'd rather like Twitter, you know, the power of these media uh, is, is, depends on numbers. And I'm, I'm quite mindful at the moment that in a way business, and I'm not quite as, as negative as Tim is about business in the UK, but um, business in the UK kind of sort of gets it. I mean, you know, you're an individual running a business who gets it, and there are plenty of people like that. And people, you know, Stuart Rose running Marks and Spencers. Got it with Plan A. You know, they spend a lot of money doing what they're doing with whatever it is, to Marks and Spencers. <laughs> that the and whether it's good energy or ecotricity or, or, or there, there are companies now really getting it and doing it, and people in this room get it and do it. And there are developers of the like mind. There are politicians of a like mind. There are activists and, and people like Rob with the transition town movement getting it. But we are all still tinkling away at the margins, aren't we? But I, personally, I think, you know, it's about... Sometimes it only takes one small lever. It only takes an, a school or a, a piece of government policy to change or a taxation break to occur, and suddenly it starts to work for us. So I, I'm... It, we're not all... We're not, it's not all there, but I see the beginnings of something happening, and it's happening centrally in government... Uh, sometimes there are horrible backward steps, 
um, when number 10 overruled DEC or overruled the Department for Communities and Local Government, you know, because they're too worried about what's going to happen in, in four years' time and they're due up for a re-election. Um, but fundamentally, I still see this as a movement which is moving forwards, not backwards. solutions and I think there's also a big power to saying I have absolutely no idea. So, like, so for example we had the, the, the thing that I showed earlier on about tooting, so the big carnival thing they did in tooting, they came to us and said we want to start doing transitioning tooting, uh, very uh, a diverse part of London, very high deprivation and so on and so on. How do we do transitioning tooting? We said we have absolutely no idea at all. We don't live in tooting, you live in tooting, you know tooting. When you figure it out we'd love to hear uh, what you come up with. So they went away for a year or so, and then what they came up with was the Trash Catchers Carnival. 1,000 people, 10,000 people came out on the streets. At the end of it, the local restaurants fed 1,000 people for nothing. Uh, you know, but that emerged from the place. It was a response that emerged from the place that was appropriate to the culture. We had people who came to Transition Network about two years ago and said, from Brazil, we want to do transition in Brazil. How do we do transition? We're working in the favelas in Sao Paulo. Uh, poorest parts of Sao Paulo, how do we do transition? I said, I have absolutely no idea, uh, but it'd be fascinating to know uh, how that works. You know? and, but they picked up transition as a loose set of principles, a loose set of ethics, a loose set of tools, and created a Brazilian transition which feels and it's of the place. The, 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 the tools are risen from that, they teach uh, transition to people who can't read, and now transition is on fire across Brazil. I mean, Brazilandia, which is one of the poorest parts of Sao Paulo, one of the favelas, there's all sorts of stuff happening there. And I think if we'd have sort of held that and said, this is how you do transition, you do it like this, then you do that, then, then all of that brilliance, all of that creativity wouldn't have happened. So giving permission and, be, and have, be, being able to say, I don't know, I think is, is really bad. It's one part of it, at least. Tim, do you want to? Um, I was still struggling with streams. Um, <laughs> 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 I, I don't know why, but I had these visions of Eric Cantona talking about, you know, the, the seagulls always follow the fishing boat or something like that. Um, I know what you mean, though. I, I know what you mean about what, what is amazing. I, I, a, I'm a huge optimist. I'm not a pessimist. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big optimist. And actually, a way to make yourself optimistic is exactly what Kevin suggested. Go back to 1990 and see how far we've come. We have actually come a long way. And actually, it's very exciting. Again, the point about example, you know, when they start to remove plastic bags in Mulberry and demonstrated for the first time you could remove plastic bags, suddenly the mood music changed about stuff like that. And I think Kevin's right that, that about government. If I was honest, I, 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 I have a deep loathing of most of the politicians I've ever met. Not because they're unpleasant people, it's because there is something really rather awful about people who aspire to power and when they get it, don't know why they want it. Um, and uh, the, the, Ronnie Hamper, who was my first chairman at Eden, who is the boss of ICI, he said, why is it politicians don't understand elementary economics? He said, we make paint at ICI, but paint has got a really rigid demand curve. The price goes up, people stop buying it. That was at that time, yeah? He said, but exactly what you're saying, if you make it the law, that in 18 months, all paint will have ecologically friendly thinners in it. Everybody knows that if the demand is now going to be that big, the price will come down and it will be exactly the same price as it was before. But government is terrified of legislation. They see that as big government, but companies are not frightened of legislation. When you talk to guys who run big companies, what they're terrified of is inappropriately applied legislation, which means that there isn't a level playing field. So drugs companies, for example, would make a lot of compromises about the price of the drugs they sell if the government could guarantee that illegal uh, or uh, uh, the drugs being imported into the country had the same strictures as what was being produced in Britain. Are you with me? So I think there's a lot that, the, 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 that Kevin is saying about government being able to change things. But the biggest thing 
I think there are an awful lot of idealists in a lot of the big companies that we have in this country. Because when you talk to their HR departments, they're finding it more and more difficult to attract the brightest and best of our generation. That is a very hopeful sign. But the problem we have is a lot of people who champion the sort of things we believe in keep talking wet. Do you know what I mean? It, it's like social enterprise. Why? I love offending people, right? If, why is there this pathetic belief that if you run a social enterprise, you shouldn't be able to become rich? It's for the people, man. Well, why? If you have a hundred million that you've made out of your social enterprise that have got all this wealth to everybody else, and you're really good at running it, why shouldn't you be a millionaire? Why do you have to carry the baggage of guilt with you and therefore not tempt people who might go to Goldman Sachs or McKinsey or whatever to do actually something that's really good for all of us, which is run some of these organizations? Let's be honest, NGOs is the work that awful I'm going to be killed. I have rarely met such an aggregation of incompetent, vain people in my life as the people who run NGOs. Right? It's a really weird thing. Inverse relationship to good benefit, nasty people. Very nasty. <laughs> right, on that point, um, let's jump to the yeah, yeah. I'm going to let, let you come back with that. There's some more questions. We are about to run out of time, so if I can get permission for the audience to run slightly over time, then I will take more questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes? Absolutely. Yes? Okay, the gentleman here in the front, and then there's two people here and two, three people at the back. Okay. Oh, bloody hell, that's loud. Um, hello, David Parks. I'm, um, I'm, I'm sort of come out of property and I've found a place, a big site in South Bristol, which is, which is very different to, uh, to, to how it is up the hill. Um, and uh, I, I, my last real property effort was working on Harborside and really realising how, how terrible we, we, we've made a place that really had an unrivaled position as a regeneration site. Um, so I got excited about this site in South Bristol and I thought, well, okay, I can bring all my property expertise to that, but what I've learned along that journey is that uh, actually it is about people. So it's really good to have Rob here because uh, letting go of some of those ideas, those ideas, the language uh, that we find so disempowering, and also the idea that we need to lobby politicians or that we need to, um, you know, find a way into those top-down models. I think the real transformation is to say, okay, how can we help the grassroots to really fulfill their ambitions? Because uh, it's not about property, it's not only about property, it is part of about property, but I recognize that in the regeneration arena, what we're doing but is uh, helping um, bring people out of disempowerment and really encouraging them to take responsibility. Um, and uh, you know that's a seismic shift, and it's not going to be done on its own. It needs help, and somehow there's a big gap, isn't there, between the government rhetoric and those who are available, uh, either through social enterprise or whatever, uh, to to fill that in. And you got a question? <laughs> so um, if let's you get to that. And that may come happen, but I think you know it's, uh, it's it's shifting ideas, and I haven't got a question. Okay, right. Okay, so can I request that we have questions, please? Okay. Next one there in the middle, two there in the middle. You can share one and the other. Uh, yeah, I was uh, born in the sixties, and uh, very new to all this, I guess. You know. But um, our friend over there has been doing this a long time, you know, and he's been sort of like up against the mountain of uh, bureaucracy, you know, uh, with his, his thoughts on his alternative transport. And I feel that way in construction, like, you know, when you think about uh, the harbour side development, the kind of marsh development, which is uh, a complete disaster as far as I'm concerned. Um, Ferguson actually introduced a proposal to. Uh, build a mini Venice, uh, take out the gas works, take out the pollutant soil, and um, put a harbour side through there, make it look quite a nice looking feature of Bristol. But what, what, what do we have now? We have um, sort of tenement flats, basically. So we have bad, still have bad plan decisions in Bristol. Um, Kingston's next. Uh, the Fry's Chocolate Factory. I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt you in a minute and get you to a question, please. So how do we actually like move on from this um, bureaucracy that we're under? I, 
I don't feel like I have a voice myself in society. Like, I don't know how to make changes. I don't know how to sort of like... Okay. So, move, so move how, how do you move on from bureaucracy and get a voice? Can we just take yeah. one more question and then we'll come back to the panel? Hello, hi. My name's Jackson Moulding. Um, I want to... The question is about uh, ownership and land ownership. I think that you know, a lot of the examples that, that you showed up there, Rob, were about people taking ownership of small little pockets of space to try and get their, their fingers in, in the ground. And I think that if we are going to do big change and make big changes, we need community access to ownership of large bits of land. And the problem is, is that large landowners, whether they're government entities, whether they're private landowners, want to get a financial return that doesn't allow for the type of projects that we all want to see in, in this environment, you know, in, in, this, in this room. So I think that how can we address land ownership you know, to, to make these projects work, whether it's sustainable housing, food growing, etc. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, well, um, land values, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, you know, for about 60 years now, uh, we've had a culture whereby a developer buys a piece of land, does absolutely nothing with it, waits five years, sells it on. The next developer buys it, gets planning consent on that land, does a turn, increases the value tenfold, sells it on. By the time the house builder comes to buy the land, it's so expensive that he has to build the crappiest housing because that's all he can afford to do. In Britain, we have got really, really good at building very, very low quality, poor standard, badly insulated, tiny housing because we've had to. Because we've had actually a planning system since the 1940s which has restricted land distribution. So our, our land prices in the UK are artificially high. Now compare it to Germany, which is a much bigger country, where land is freely and regularly distributed by the states then, where uh, the average house costs a lot more money to build than it does here, but is bigger and cheaper than the equivalent home here. And it's all to do with the fact that if you buy a house, for example, in the southeast of England, up to 75% of the house value is the land on which it sits. A lot of people have got very, very rich out of doing nothing in property development and treating it as a means of creating a large amount of cash for doing very little. And I, I, I think the... Um, to, I, I'm, I am no uh, spokesman for the government, but I, the, the national planning policy framework, which throws away those 70 years of legislation... Now, what gives us, albeit in rather a vague, nebulous way, that's going to be open to a lot of discussion and interpretation over the next few years, it does give us an opportunity to, to completely renegotiate that bottom up for communities to cut the bureaucracy, as you say, and devise their local plans with their local authorities, for local authorities to be building social housing in. The Homes and Community Agency has been told it must start selling land at very affordable prices for community self build so the community, the Homes and Community Agency is no longer solely in the market of dealing with developers and housing associations. It must start dealing with communities and small-scale self-builders. Now, I, I don't for a moment imagine that we're going to see a world devoid of red tape or bureaucracy or, or processes which we have to go through or form filling. But my God, if we can have a planning system which at least disposes of brownfield sites and helps to re-intensify and revitalise our city centres, at prices which are reasonable, and Jackson, you've built, you know, in a city centre, uh, and, um, you know, uh, albeit, you know, I'm sure you'd like to see more of those schemes, uh, then we, we, we could move towards something which, which at least would allow us to build something decent, uh, homes that are a reasonable size to a decent quality, that's all. I think when you look at some of the tools that are coming through localism, the, the, the neighbourhood planning and the right to buy and all that kind of stuff, Sometimes when I look through them, I really wonder whether the kind of people I meet who've pushed those things through really have thought through the power that they're potentially giving to, to communities. So certainly with, with, with the Atmos project, the development, which is an eight-acre site in, in Totnes, which is quite substantial. Um, actually, you know, we could, uh, we, we're, we've sort of basically cut off the, develop, the, the, the site owner's options, because actually now we can say, we'll run a neighborhood plan, we'll design what we want to happen here, we run a referendum, 50%, that's what's happening on that side. Uh, it's, it's very exciting, I think you're right. I think things are, things are changing very, very quickly. Uh, and 
Yeah, and so certainly with, with the Atmos project, actually we were able to mobilise people. People really, really cared about it. The meeting that we had, our MP chaired it, we sat down with the developer. She said, as far as this community is concerned, Atmos is what's happening on that site. What, what happens next? And that's partly because of the, the campaign that had been built up just over two and a half, uh, three months. You know, people want this kind of development now. People are fed up with the kind of, that hideous picture uh, that Kevin showed of, the, of, of all those houses that looked exactly the same. That, that, that's where he lives. And actually, there's, there's so many things sort of coming through that are really <coughs> pushing and supporting the kind of thing. It was really refreshing to hear what you said about, uh, you know, about how your thinking has shifted around what, what the role of development is. And I think the tools that we're being presented with, we're in transition network, we're now really starting to think how we can turn to communities and say, do you realise you can now do this and this and this? You know, there's all sorts of possibilities there. All I would say is bother. <laughs> so many people are tossers who talk all day about wanting to change the world. They're the same people who say, I wish I could win the lottery, buy a ticket. You know, mm. Actually, if you want to change where you live, and you to talk about disempowerment and all that, it really annoys me. Because my whole life experience is if you get three or four people to believe in something, you create an unstoppable force. And it's about bothering to get out of bed, meeting people, organizing yourself. You can change almost anything because there is nothing more powerful than meeting a group of people who have a common purpose. No one can stop, stand against you. Look what you've done with the, in Top Nest. But it's real. The problem for people like Rob is he does it with the dairy and everybody says, yeah, I can see why you did it there, but it, no, it's real. You could do it in Bristol, but you need to get a few people organized who turn up, drink a bottle of wine, two bottles of wine, get angry, get 10 yeah. people, and drink I, some more wine. I think the really interesting point Rob made is that it's not him that does it. And there's an expectation that so often, you, you come here, come here, we want your magic. We you come do it for us. But actually you're saying, no, 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 we, we, we can show you how it's done here and we can give you pointers, but, but you do it. Mm, exactly. And make it different here. Make it your place. Make it distinctive to where you are. Mm. 